Welcome to this lecture series on eukaryotic gene expression, basics and benefits. <coughs> Today we are going to discuss about uh, cloning and expression vectors <coughs> because the purpose of this lecture course is not only to explain some of the major concepts in the area of eukaryotic gene expression and make you understand how gene expression is regulated. We also time and again keep emphasizing how this knowledge that we have obtained from these basic research has been or is being used for the benefit of mankind. <coughs> so, one of the very important aspects of regulation of gene expression that has really benefited mankind is our ability to produce recombinant proteins. <coughs> A number of recombinant proteins like insulin, growth hormone, interferons and many other proteins are now being produced in large amounts both in microbial as well as mammalian expression systems and this has largely benefited mankind in a big way. <coughs> So, it is very important for us to understand how one designs or one constructs expression vectors, what kind of expression vectors are now being used and tomorrow if you want to now express a protein using a particular promoter, what kind of expression vector you would decide, design, would you express it in a prokaryotic vector, would you express in a eukaryotic vector, all this information is very, very essential. So, the way I have designed this lecture series is not only you understand some of the basic concepts of eukaryotic gene expression, but time and again you also apply this knowledge and see how we can or how this knowledge has been used for the benefit of mankind. So, one of the important aspects in the area of biotechnology which has really made a huge difference is our ability to express proteins from any species in any other species. So, today we can easily take a gene that codes for a protein from a plant or from a human uh, uh, human protein and you can put it in either in a plant in a E. coli system or you can express it in a yeast vector or you can express in a plant and so on and so forth. So, let us now try to try and to understand how these expression vectors or how these cloning vectors are designed and how you can actually clone genes into these vectors and sometimes express this pro exp gene so that you can get your protein of your interest. <coughs> so, let us try to understand about cloning and expression vectors. <coughs> So, the knowledge <coughs> that expression of protein coding gene can be induced by placing this gene downstream of a promoter has led to the development of a number of expression vectors both prokaryotic as well as eukaryotic. So, today it is possible if we want for example, <coughs> any gene that you are interested in whether this gene can go for insulin or growth hormone or any protein that is of interest to you, you can take this gene put it downstream of a promoter of your choice and you can make this protein in that particular organism of your choice. This is explained much better in the next slide. <coughs> for example, suppose you want to express either insulin or growth hormone or hepatitis B surface antigen or a clotting factor like factor 8. You simply take these genes which coding for these respective proteins and clone it into a promoter of your choice. For example, if you want to express this in a bacterial system, you put this gene in front of a bacterial promoter and you have to construct what is called as a bacterial expression plasmid. <coughs> On the other hand, if you want to express this gene in a yeast cells, you have to put this gene in front of an yeast promoter and construct what is called as an yeast expression vector. <coughs> the same way, if you want to express your gene in insect cells, you have to express what is called construct what are called as insect expression vectors and you have to use a promoter that works in insect cells. And so, similarly, if you want to express in mammalian cells including human cells, you have to clone this gene in front of a mammalian promoter and make what is called as a mammalian expression plasmid and introduce them into mammalian cells and mammalian cells will now start expressing your gene of interest and your protein will be made in mammalian cells. <coughs> and last but not least, you can also now express your gene of interest in plant cells. All that you have to do is you put a plant promoter in front of this gene and make a plant expression plasmid introduce into plant cells. Now, plant cells will make your protein of your interest. So, you can see the idea or the knowledge that promoters which contain binding for transcription factor sites and RNA polymerase, <coughs> they can be exploited for expressing the expression of any downstream gene has now led to the development of what are called as a recombinant DNA technology and production of recombinant proteins of your choice. And is one of the major <coughs> areas in the area of biotechnology where a number of industries and number of companies are expressing a number of therapeutic proteins using this kind of a cloning technology. So, let us spend some time to understand how do you design a cloning vector, how do you design an expression vector and what kind of expression vectors and cloning vectors are being used. <coughs> so, expression vectors became the basic tools for biotechnology for the production of recombinant proteins. This is going to be the basis of today's lecture. <coughs> So, what is an expression vector? 
An expression vector is usually a plasmid that is used to introduce a specific gene into a target gel and express the protein that is coded for by the gene. <coughs> so, once inside the host cell, the gene encoded by the expression vector is transcribed by the host transcription machinery that is the host transcription factors and host RNA polymerase will transcribe the gene and the RNA that is synthesized is then translated by the host translation machinery leading to the synthesis of a particular protein of your interest. So, if the gene has to be expressed inside the host cells, you need to contain the expression plasmid should contain regulatory sequences that act as either enhancer and promoter regions and lead to efficient transcription of genes carried by the expression vector. So, if you want to express a gene of your interest in a particular system either bacteria or yeast or a mammalian system, the regulatory region that you have chosen must contain a promoter and powerful enhancers. So, that powerful transcription factors can go and bind to these sequences and a large amount of mRNA can be synthesized which in turn gets translated into a protein and you can then make your protein of your interest in large amounts. So, the goal of a well designed expression vector is therefore, production of large amounts of mRNA and therefore, large amounts of proteins. So, this is what is the rationale behind constructing an expression vector. <coughs> So, the design and development of expression vectors and their use in biotechnology for the benefit of mankind is very closely linked to discoveries in two major areas namely recombinant DNA technology also known as genetic engineering. <coughs> so, a lot of development took place in the, in the period between 1970s to 1990s advances in cell biology, recombinant DNA technology, cloning technology and so on and so forth and it is these technologies together with our knowledge that promoters and enhancers are important for the expression of uh, genes uh, has led to the development of an entire area of biotechnology leading to a new field wherein you can express any protein of your interest and make what are called as the recombinant proteins. So, let us spend some time to understand what are the important advances that took place in the area of recombinant DNA technology or genetic engineering especially in the early 70s and late 70s and how these advances has led to the development of expression vectors and a billion dollar biotech industry leading to the expression of recombinant proteins. Now, in 1972 a researcher known as Paul Berg in Stanford University, California used certain enzymes called restriction enzymes. These are enzymes which can specifically cut DNA by recognizing specific sequences. Today we know there are a number of such restriction enzymes. For example, you have an enzyme called ECOR1 which cuts a specific sequence called GAATTC. So, if you have a DNA and if you have the sequence GAATTC and if you add ECOR1 to this uh, DNA preparation, it will cut this DNA wherever GAATTC is there. So, like that we have a number of restriction enzymes now, the number is now goes in thousands. These restriction enzymes are usually present in bacterial cells. These enzymes have been purified and recombinant enzymes are now available. So, using these enzymes, you can precisely cut DNA at specific regions. So, what Paul Berg did in 1972 is to use such a restriction enzyme and isolate a gene from human cancer causing monkey virus called as the simian virus party or SV40 party, SV40 and used an enzyme called DNA ligase to join this virus DNA with a molecule of DNA from a bacterial phage called a bacterial virus called lambda. So, he cut a monkey virus DNA with a restriction enzyme and took this DNA and joined to a DNA which is present in the lambda phage or the lambda DNA by using DNA ligase. So, restrictions and cuts the DNA, you take this DNA and you can ligate or attach it to another DNA molecule from a bacterial phage origin using a ligase. This is the first example of creation of a recombinant DNA. Today, recombinant DNA technology or genetic engineering is a household name, but it is Paul Berg who actually demonstrated for the first time that using restriction enzymes, you can cut a DNA from a <coughs> mammalian virus and then put it into a and or ligate it or attach to a DNA from a bacteriophage. <coughs> Berg realized that this experiment of making chimeras that is you can take DNA from one species and ligate to the spe uh, DNA of another species may have very tremendous uh, advantages and if it is not used properly can lead to lot of uh, uh, um, lot of uh, disadvantages or uh, dangers to the mankind and therefore, he suggested that the regulatory agency should come forth and then design proper guidelines so that a recombinant DNA technology whoever wants to use this recombinant technology follow these guidelines and some kind of a uh, overseeing body is there to make sure that this recombinant technology is not used improperly. So, he did this experiment and he proposed that for at least one other one year nobody does this recombinant in experiments till proper guidelines are framed. <coughs> then he later resumed 
and his effort, this paper he was published in PNAS in 1972, Biochemical Method for Inserting New Genetic Information into DNA of Simian Virus Party, Circular SV40 DNA Containing Lambda Phage Genes and the Galactose Operon of E. coli. It is a landmark paper which actually discusses the generation of a first common DNA molecule and for which Paul Berg was awarded Nobel Prize in the year 1980. <coughs> okay. so, Paul Berg got the credit for generating the first recombinant DNA molecule where he took a DNA from a monkey virus and inserted into a lambda or a bacteriophage virus and demonstrated that it is possible to stitch two different kinds of DNAs together using recombinant DNA technology. Now, around the same time Paul Berg was doing these experiments, two researchers Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer, <coughs> one person was in University of California and another person is in Stanford University. They actually were also interested in generating this kind of recombinant DNA molecules and they actually met in a scientific conference in Hawaii which was discussing on plasmids. Plasmids are nothing but circular extra chromosomal DNA molecules which are present in bacterial cells. We will discuss little bit later exactly what plasmids are. So, this conference was actually discussing about plasmids because those are the time these plasmids were actually being generated and being researchers working on this plasmid in a big way. So, they were attending a conference which was primarily discussing about plasmids and how these plasmids confer antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And they met over a cup of coffee and Boyer's lab were actually had isolated enzyme known as the restriction enzymes which actually Paul Berg had actually used to generate recombinant DNA. And these restriction enzymes as I told earlier can be used precisely to cut DNA into segments and then using enzymes called DNA ligases you can ligate it to another DNA molecule. This is what Paul Berg also did. So, Boyer's lab is the one who actually isolated the first <coughs> restriction enzyme. Stanley Cohen had actually developed a method to introduce antibiotic back carrying plasmids into certain bacteria as well as a method of isolating and cloning genes carried by plasmids. So, here is one person who discovered enzymes that can precisely cut DNA and here is another person who was trying to characterize plasmids and how to introduce plasmids into E. coli cells. <coughs> They soon realized while discussing over a cup of coffee that if they can combine their expertise together, they can actually generate a lot of money you know, because this technology has tremendous potential. So, they can introduce any gene into bacterial cells and you can express these genes and this can have tremendous implications. So, what Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer did is <coughs> they published the paper between 1973 and 1974. Uh, before publishing the paper, they also filed uh, two patents one in 1974 and 1975 about how this process of joining two DNA molecules can have tremendous importance and how proteins can be made synthesized in bacteria organisms like E. coli or other prokaryotic species. So, this US patent number 4237224 is one of the landmark patents in the area of biotechnology. They filed a patent around 1973 and 1974 and the US patent office actually granted this patent in 1980. <coughs> As I speak today, today if you ask me which of the most profitable biotechnology patents in the area of biotechnology, the Cohen and Boyer patent is one of them. <coughs> you can see the two patents of generating recombinant DNA which was filed by Stanford and University of California called as the Cohen Boyer patent. This patent covers the fundamental technology used throughout molecular biologists including recombinant DNA research and from 1980 till 1995 in about 15 years time these patents generated an income of about 139 million dollars. So, whoever generates recombinant DNA molecule and which ha has been used for making a recombinant protein has to pay royalties to the University of California and Stanford because they own the intellectual property for this. So, you can see how this knowledge that you can use restriction enzymes to create a recombinant DNA molecule and this recombinant DNA molecule or in the form of plasmids can be introduced into bacterial cells and you can make a protein of your interest has generated a huge amount of money and has now led to a billion dollar biotechnology industry. <coughs> so, expression of genes using appropriate promoters and inserting this gene into appropriate plasmid vectors and uh, making bacteria make proteins in large amounts has had a huge impact in the area of biotechnology. Boyer went on to find uh, found what is called say biotech company called Genentech. This is the world's first biotechnology company. Today we have a number of such companies. So, the credit for finding the first biotechnology company goes to Boyer along with another venture capitalist and Genentech then went on to produce human insulin bacteria. So, using this recombinant technology what Boyer did is 
they chemically synthesized the insulin gene and put this insulin gene in a bacterial expression plasmid and demonstrated that bacterial cells can now make insulin. So, this was the first demonstration of a production of a recombinant protein using recombinant unit technology. So, Genentech in September 1978 actually demonstrated that a human protein can be produced in bacteria and they licensed this technology to another biotech company called Eli Lilly and by 1980 this marked the start of a biotech industry. So, you can see it is the Stanley and Stanley Cohen and Boyer who are actually responsible for a for the creation of a huge biotech industry that is now running to billions and billions of dollars now. So, Genentech was the first biotech company to be formed followed by Biogen in 1980 which actually produced another very important molecule called interferon using the same recombinant unit technology and by 1988 within about 8 years time 5 proteins were produced using bacterial cells and were actually approved by United States Food and Drug Administration for use in humans. These include synthetic insulin, human growth hormone, hepatitis B vaccine, alpha interferon and a <coughs> blood clotting uh, uh, protein called uh, uh, a protein which is involved in blood, dissolving blood clots called tissue plasminogen activator. So, 5 important therapeutic proteins were actually synthesized using this recombinant DNA technology patented by Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer. <coughs> So, by the end of 90s at least 125 more genetic engineering drugs were approved. So, you can see what was the impact of this demonstration of a recombinant DNA technology by Cohen and Boyer. Today over 350 billion dollars has been invested in biotech industry since the emergence of this industry starting from Genentech and global revenues rose from 23 billion dollars in 2000 to more than 50 billion dollars in 2005. So, you can see the roots or the fundamental <coughs> the foundation for the biotech industry that is prospering today was actually laid by Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer way back in 1970s when they created the first recombinant DNA molecule and one of them started to, found, uh, uh, to establish the first biotech company Genentech. So, the growth of recombinant DNA technology in addition to these this discoveries another important discovery also made sure that commercialization of this fundamental knowledge became possible and that is another important ruling by a US Supreme Court where which actually in 1980 had demonstrated or ruled that another Indian who is residing in United States at the time Anand Chakravarti <coughs> was granted a patent when he was working in a company called General Electric that you can actually patent a genetically modified living organism. So, the patenting of creation of recombinant DNA molecules and the and the, and the rule, US Supreme Court ruling that you can actually patent genetically modified microorganisms. These are the two very important events that took place in the early 70s and uh, between 1970s and 1980s that actually are responsible for the growth of a billion dollar biotechnology industry today. So, starting from Genentech in 1976, you had a number of other biotech companies which were formed in United States, Biogen, Amgen, Immunex, Chiron, Genzyme and so on and so forth and all these companies exploited this knowledge and made a number of recombinant proteins that is being used by <coughs> human beings all through. So, as I speak today more than 325 million people worldwide have been helped by 160 approved biotech drugs and vaccines. So, you can see this technology has led to expression of so many recombinant proteins and so many recombinant vaccines are being used or made by this recombinant DNA technology. 350 more biotech drugs and vaccines are now in various stages of clinical trials that can that if many of them are successful you can actually can cure a number of diseases which are at least about 200 of them and biotechnology is today responsible for hundreds of diagnostic tests, HIV tests, pregnancy tests, DNA fingerprinting and so on and so forth. So, the recombinant DNA production or recombinant protein production which was started with Herber and Boyer is now prospering as a very very successful biotech industry today. So, having said how important it was to demonstrate or express clone genes into bacterial cells express these genes successfully, let us now spend some time to understand how does one design vectors for cloning genes as well as for making recombinant proteins. <coughs> So, I gave this introduction so that you understand the importance of this knowledge of generating or making recombinant proteins. So, let us now try to understand some signs of it, how exactly one would go about and construct a cloning vector, how would you go about and construct a expression vector, which is actually the basis for the making recombinant proteins in a number of organisms. So, I am going to start explaining to you with what are called as plasmid vectors and phage vectors. <coughs> 
these are actually prokaryotic vectors. Although this course is on eukaryotic gene expression, because the entire uh, protein expression system started with prokaryotic vectors and a number of eukaryotic proteins have been expressed using prokaryotic expression vectors, we must first understand how prokaryotic vectors were designed and it is the design and the development of the prokaryotic vectors which then paved for way for the development of eukaryotic, eukaryotic vectors. So, in this class let us spend some time to understand the history or the development of various vectors that were actually used in prokaryotes and in the next class we will discuss how this knowledge was used for the development of various eukaryotic vectors. So, what is a vector? A vector is used to amplify a single molecule of DNA into many copies and then a DNA mag fragment is actually inserted into this plasmid vector and <coughs> in addition to this recombinant DNA molecule, this cloning vector should also have what is called as an origin of replication. So, that once you introduce into bacterial cells, this vector should be able to replicate, so that it can make large amounts of this plasmid vectors, vectors. So, these are basically what is called as a plasmid vector. So, the general features of these vectors, so to you want, suppose you want to now clone a gene into a vector, what kind of a vector you would use? A vector must be able to replicate autonomously in a host cell. If you want to make a bacterial cloning vector, that vector should be able to express uh, replicate in bacteria, uh, replicate autonomously in bacterial vectors. Or uh, if you want to put it in yeast cells, it should be able to express or it should be able to replicate in yeast cells or in mammalian cells, you should have a mammalian origin of replication, so it can replicate in mammalian cells. So, vectors must be able to replicate autonomously in a host cell and must have suitable restriction enzyme size for the introduction of foreign DNA because you can precisely cut the vector at a specific site and introduce your gene of interest into those sites. So, the presence of origin of replication, the presence of convenient restriction sites is a must for a vector. In addition, the vector should also have a selectable markers. Usually, genes coding for antibiotic resistance are used as selectable markers because you have to distinguish cells which have taken up the DNA and cells which are now taken up the DNA. Remember, the, this procedure called as transformation of bacterial cells is a very, very inefficient process and only 1 in 1000 or 1 in 100,000, 1 in a million cells actually take up this DNA depending upon the efficiency of a transformation procedure. So, majority of the cells do not take up your DNA. So, you need to have a mechanism by which you have distinguished cells which have taken up the DNA and those which have not taken up the DNA that is usually done using appropriate selectable markers. It should also have a restriction enzyme sites, so that you can clone your gene of your interest. <coughs> it should also have insertion activation indication indicator genes, that is genes that are insertionally disrupted by the cloning process to indicate that cloning has occurred. It should also have a promoter, usually if you are interested in expressing a protein of your interest, it should have a strong promoter upstream of the cloning site, so that when you clone your gene in the multiple cloning site, the upstream promoter the transcription factors and RNA polymerase should bind to the promoter and transcribe your gene of your interest. It should also have a terminator at the end of the gene, so that after transcription, the transcription is terminated and, <coughs> and of course, as I said, it should have an origin of replication, so that when you put it in the organism, you can, the organisms can make multiple copies of this vector, so you can make large amount of this vector. So, these are some of the general features of a, what, what is called as a vector. Plasmids, as I have already mentioned, plasmids are nothing but circular double stranded DNA molecules that exist in bacteria and in the nuclei of some of the eukaryotic cells, like yeast cells also have some plasmids. They usually replicate independently of the host cell, they are called as autonomous replicating elements. The size of the plasmids vary from few kb to 100 kb. <coughs> These are called as mega plasmids, bacteria like Pseudomonas have many plasmids, mega plasmids ranging up to 100 kb and these or actually have actually genes which can uh, metabolize number of exotic compounds. <coughs> and plasmids usually can DNA up to 10 kilobases can be easily inserted into the plasmids. <coughs> plasmids may encode a wide variety of genetic determinants which permit their bacterial host to survive better in an advanced environment or to compete better with other microorganisms occupying the same ecological niche. So, Bacteria which have plasmids have several advantages over those which do not have plasmids. One of the most important genes that these plasmids carry are the genes coding for antibiotic resistance. So, when bacteria have these antibiotic resistance genes on plasmids, they are resistant to antibiotics, whereas those bacteria which do not have this kind of a genes, they are susceptible for bacteria. In fact, today one of the major problems in the area of biomedical research is the emergence of what are called as the drug resistance bacteria and plasmids play a very, very important role in this. <coughs>
So, plasmids have enormous medical importance since some of them encode antibiotic resistance as well as specific virulence traits. So, many genes which are responsible for virulence of certain pathogenic bacteria are also included by the plasmids. Plasmids rely on, rely, plasmids rely on host encoded factors for the replication and plasmid replication initiates a predetermined site called ORI or origin of replication. So, the plasmid should contain a region called as ORI or the origin of replication from which the origin of replication can start. It should have convenient restriction sites, it should have an appropriate promoter for expression of gene, it should have certain selectable markers, usually antibiotic resistant genes for selection. Now, let us see what kind of plasmid vectors people have been using for the last years. I just listed some of the plasmid vectors here, PSC 101, PBR 322, PUC series 8, 9, 18, 19 and so on and so forth and something called as shuttle vectors. So, let us discuss some of these vectors and see what are these vectors and how these vectors were actually used for making cloning genes and expressing genes. So, I am going to discuss the first generation plasmid vectors. The reason why I told you the story of Stanley Cohen Herbert, Herbert Boyer is the plasmid vector which Stanley Cohen designed is actually belongs to the first generation plasmid vector which actually responsible for generating a huge amount of money and led to the birth of the first biotech company and a billion dollar biotech industry. This is the plasmid which Stanley Cohen actually made and which he patented and made a huge amount of money. That is why it is called as PSC 101, SC stands for Stanley Cohen. <coughs> Now, this plasmid vector as you can see, it is uh, loaded from an ATCC website. He actually deposited this vector in American Type Culture Collection. You can go and anybody can go and buy this vector anytime you want, the, the website here. So, this is the vector here and as you can see here, it contains an antibiotic resistant gene called TET or. So, if E. coli contains this plasmid, they become resistant to tetracycline. It also has a site for an restriction enzyme called BAM H1 and many other restriction sites. <coughs> so, if you now cut this plasmid with BAM H1, now there is the antibiotic resistance gene is disrupted and you can now clone another gene which contained a BAM H and vents into this and such bacteria carrying this plasmids now cannot grow on tetracycline. Whereas, bacteria in which the foreign gene is not inserted can happily grow on tetracycline. So, you can see you can easily distinguish between two different bacteria, bacteria which contain the unmodified plasmid and bacteria containing a recombinant plasmid in which a foreign gene has been inserted into this antibiotic resistant gene. So, by based on the sensitivity to tetracycline, you can distinguish organisms which contain a recombinant plasmid, organisms which contain only the PSC 101. This is the plasmid Stanley Cohen actually designated to demonstrate that it is possible to generate recombinant DNA molecules and propagate them in bacteria. <coughs> Following this PSC 101, a number of second generation vectors were actually developed. <coughs> One of them which was very popular in the 1980s and 1990s is a vector called PBR 322. This plasmid is about 4 kilobase in size. It is a low copy number plasmid. Plasmids are of two types. One is called as a low copy number, another high copy number. There are some plasmids which are present in more than 100 to 200 copies per cell. These are called as high, high copy plasmid numbers, whereas there are other plasmids which are present only in 1s and 10s and these are called as low copy number plasmids. And the P it also had restriction sites for enzymes like ECOR1, BAMH1, PST, HINDI3, etcetera and they were located on two antibiotic resistant markers, ampicillin and tetracycline. PSA101 which Herbert Boyer used, <coughs> Stanley Cohen used had only one antibiotic resistant marker that is tetracycline. PBR322 has two antibiotic resistance marker, one for code resistance for tetracycline, another for ampicillin. So, you can see you can actually clone a gene into the PST1 site here, which will disturb the ampicillin resistant gene. And therefore, if you clone your gene of your interest in the PST1 set of ampicillin resistant gene, and cells then which harbor such kind of a recombinant plasmids will now be resistant to tetracycline, but sensitive to ampicillin. Okay? On the other hand, if you clone your foreign gene or gene of your interest, the damage one site and disturb the tetracycline gene and E. coli cells harboring such recombinant DNA molecules will be resistant to ampicillin, but sensitive to tetracycline. So, depending upon which antibiotic resistant gene you are introducing your gene, you can either score for tetracycline resistance or ampicillin resistance. So, E. coli cells harboring only the PBR32 will be resistant for both tetracycline and ampicillin, whereas if you clone your gene into the ampicillin gene, cells harboring this will be resistant to tetracycline, whereas if you clone your gene into a tetracycline gene, those cells will be resistance for ampicillin. So, using this kind of a differential antibiotic selection markers, you can distinguish <coughs> cells which harbor your recombinant DNA molecules. <coughs> 
So, cloning into one of the restriction sites just like what I mentioned now would activate one of the antimatic resistance markers leaving the other for the selection of the transformation. So, insertion of your foreign gene would inactivate the restriction marker uh, antibiotic resistance marker and that can be you taken advantage for selection of those har cells harboring this particular uh, recombinant DNA. Screening for the absence of the second antimatic marker was the putative evidence of a successful cloning event and lower molecular weight of the PBR thin it was also allowed cloning of larger fragments. So, this was the first very popular cloning vector which was designed after Stanley Cohen's PSC 101. <coughs> PBR322 was one of the most commonly used E. coli cloning vectors, especially in the late 1980s and late 1990s. It had a replication called REP responsible for the replication of the plasmate. It also had a ROP gene which codes for a ROP protein which promotes the conversion of the unstable RNA1, RNA2 complex to a stable complex and serve to decrease the copy number. So, PBR322 is a very low copy number plasmate and the BLA gene actually code for the beta lactamase protein which actually confer resistance to ampicillin whereas, the TEP gene codes for the tetracycline resistance protein. Okay. So, these are the basic features of a second generation plasmid vector PBR322 which are two antibiotic selection markers, an origin of replication <coughs> and a low copy number property. <coughs> third generation plasmid vectors, the third generation plasmid vectors are known as PUC vectors it started from PUC 1, 2, 3 and so on and went on up to PUC 18, 19 and so on and so forth. These PUC plasmids were actually engineered from PBR322 origin of replication to include the alpha portion of a beta galactosidase gene. Now, beta galactosidase is, is an enzyme involved in lactose metabolism. <coughs> it, uh, so, it has the promoter of the beta galactosidase gene. The beta portion of the lac was included in the chromosome of the host. So, the host containing the plasmid was lac plus. I will explain this in a little bit later in more detail what is called as an alpha complementation. Basically, the PUC also had more restriction sites than the PBR322. For example, the PUC 8 or 9 plasmid had 6 restriction sites, whereas PUC 18 and 19 had 10 restriction sites and this is actually called as the multiple cloning site or the MCS or a polylink. And this multiple cloning site is the place where you can insert your foreign genes. <coughs> So, when you insert your gene into this multiple cloning site, it would disrupt the lag gene and therefore, the lag protein would not be made and therefore, cells harboring a recombinant PUC plasmate will form white colonies. Whereas, if you do not insert a gene, the lag gene will be properly made and those cells <coughs> will, uh, if you now plate these cells on a plate containing what is called a chromogenic substrate called X gal, it will cleave, beta galactose will clean this X gal and you get blue colonies. So, E. coli cells which harbor this plasmid, PUC plasmid will turn blue if you plate them on a plate containing X gal, whereas if you clone a gene into this PUC plasmid and then plate them on X gal plate, those E. coli colony will be white in color. So, using simply blue white selection, you can distinguish cells which have taken up the native plasmid and cells which have contained the recombinant plasmid. The native lag promoter is situated just upstream of the cloning gene allowing the expression of genes on insert that are correctly oriented and most of the non-essential uh, DNA has been removed to provide ability to clone larger fragments. And as you can see, the PBR322 was almost about 4 kb, right? <coughs> whereas, the PUC 90 is only about 2.6 kb. So, the vector size is much smaller and therefore, larger plasmids can be cloned into PUC. <coughs> it had an ampicillin selection marker for selection for antibiotic resistance. This is the detailed map of the PUC plasmid. As I said, the multiple cloning site contained a number of restriction sites here. So, if you insert your gene of interest, you can clone your gene of interest in any of these restriction enzymes and then you can use a blue white selection to select the recombinant plasmids. This is what explains how exactly you do the selection after cloning your genes into PUC plasmids. The PUC plasmid had a high copy number. Remember, the second generation plasmid PBR322 is a low copy number plasmid, whereas the PUC plasmids are high copy number plasmids. <coughs> the BLA gene actually is responsible confer the beta, it codes for a beta lactamase, therefore, confers resistance for ampicillin. The region of the E. coli operon lac containing the cap protein, I am sure those of you who have studied prokaryotic gene expression would have studied lac operon in detail how lac operon is regulated, you have what is called as an operator, promoter and then structural genes and how two proteins, the lac repressor and the cap protein play a very important role in the regulation of lac operon. I will not go into the details. So, basically the equal lac operon containing the cap protein binding site as well as the uh, 
promoter P lac and the lac capacitor binding site is part of the vector that what constitute the promoter. So, because you have this lag promoter here, the POC actually serves as an expression vector. So, if you clone your gene downstream of, downstream of this uh, POC plasmate, you can actually express your protein of your interest. <coughs> so, when you clone your gene downstream of the gene, the gene gets expressed using the lag promoter and whose expression can be induced by isopropyl thiogalactose or IPTG. <coughs> so, the synthesis of the, <coughs> the basically this uh, this vector contains only 5 prime terminal part of the lag Z gene encoding the n terminal part of the beta lactose days. So, this is where the uh, very unique system comes. This plasmid contains only the 5 prime region of the lag Z gene. So, it only codes for the amino terminal amino acids of the lag Z. The C terminal amino acids of lag Z actually comes from the chromosomal bacterial chromosome. So, only if you have both the amino terminal part and carbox terminal part of the lag Z together, then you will get a functional lactose, lactose, beta lactose days or lag Z protein. So, if you have only the vector, then you will, uh, if you have only the, both the vector and the uh, appropriate host, you get a functional beta galactosidase. But if you clone your gene into this multiple cloning site, then a functional uh, amino terminal part of the lag Z will not be made and therefore, a functional lag Z gene will not be produced. So, in the presence of IPTG, which is nothing but isopropyl thiogalactose, which is an inducible of the lac operon, they synthesize both the fragments one coding for the amino terminal region of lag Z, another coding for the carbox terminal region of the lag Z, which comes from the bacterial chromosome and therefore, you get functional uh, beta galactosidase. and if you grow such colonies on a medium containing what is called as an X gal, you get blue colonies and that is what is shown here. You can see there are blue colonies here. Whereas, if you insert a gene into the multiple cloning site, then the amino terminal lag Z will not be made and therefore, you will not get a functional lag Z protein and such bacteria which contain a recombinant plasmid in which the gene is inserted into the multiple site will become white on the plate, you can see here. So, the blue colonies means the cells which are expressing only the PUC plasmid, the white colonies are those which are expressing recombinant PUC plasmids in which the insert has been inserted. So, bacteria carrying the recombinant plasmid therefore, give right to white colonies. This entire process known as the alpha complementation is actually described here, you can see the chromosomal DNA codes for the carbox terminal fragment of the beta galactose days. So, if you have, if you do not have plasmate, the E. coli can express only the carbox terminal part of the lag Z and therefore, it can form only a white colony in presence of IPTG and X gal. Whereas, if you now introduce the PUC plasmid into this bacterial cell, the C terminal part will be made from the bacterial chromosome, the lag Z, the amino terminal region of the lag Z will be made from the plasmate. Therefore, both complement each other, you get a functional beta galactose days and now if you plate them on a plate containing IPTG and XGAL, you get blue colonies. So, by doing what is called as a blue white selection, you can distinguish cells which are harboring only the plasmid and cells which are harboring the recombinant plasmids. It is a very, very popular method of uh, generating recombinant molecules in laboratories. So, we have so far discussed about what is called the first generation plasmid vectors, second generation plasmid vectors, third generation plasmid vectors. Now, there are also very important vectors called as shuttle vectors, that is what is described here. Shuttle vectors are plasmid vectors that have origins of replication for more than one cloning host. So, virtually shuttle vectors can replicate in two different organisms. <coughs> for example, there is a vector called as PMK34 which has a gram positive origin for cloning in bacillus subtilis and gram negative origin of replication for cloning in E. coli. So, it can replicate in both the hosts, both in bacillus as well as in E. coli. So, in this way genetic engineering may be done in E. coli because E. coli is a much more easy organism to manipulate <coughs> and once you do all the basic cloning techniques in E. coli and generate a recombinant plasmid, then you can take this recombinant plasmid and put it in bacillus subtilis for expression. In fact, Many eukaryotic expression vectors, which we are going to discuss extensively in the next class, they are called as shuttle vectors because they contain a eukaryotic promoter, but they will contain a bacterial origin of replication as well as a mammalian origin of replication. So, you can first do all the cloning into this vector and put them in bacteria and make this bacteria, make this plasma in large amounts and then introduce them into a eukaryotic cell. Then the eukaryotic promoter will work in eukaryotic cells and your protein can be expressed there. So, shuttle vectors vectors are very, very important for making recombinant protein, proteins and expressing genes of your interest. Now, what are the limitations of plasmid vectors? <coughs> they can accom accommodate only small inserts. So, if you have a gene which is more than 10 kb, 
you cannot clone them into bacterial vectors, I mean uh, plasmid vectors because they cannot accommodate more than 10 kb in sensor size. The efficiency of transformation also is very low. So, if there are probably 10,000 or 1000 cells of bacteria, only 1 or 2 percent of them actually take up the plasmid. But although there are now more efficient methods of transformation like electroporation and so on and so forth, the efficiency of transformation is still high. Therefore, it becomes very, very important to have an appropriate selection marker so that you can easily kill the cells which have not taken up your recombinant DNA. That is why the blue white selection, antibiotic resistance, they all become very, very important because of the low efficiency of transformation. You can eliminate all those cells which have not taken up the recombinant DNA. The colony size are usually large, I mean, if the E. coli colonies are very large, and therefore, you cannot screen too many colonies. This is a big drawback because if you want to now make genomic libraries where you want a large, huge number of colonies on a plate, then the bacteria are not the ideal ones. That is where you have to do what is called the phage vectors, which we will discuss in the next few minutes. So, you can only screen, screen few recombinants per plate because the colonies are very small. So, you cannot plate this into very high cell density. So, that is one of the major drawbacks of plasmid vectors. So, because of these drawbacks in plasmid vectors, that is smaller size of cloning and you cannot screen too many colonies. <coughs> and the third one is uh, low efficiency of transformation. People went on to develop what are called as the phage vectors. So, what is a phage? Phage is a virus that infects a bacterial cell. So, it is basically a bacterial virus. So, there are a number of viruses which routinely infect bacteria and lyse them. So, people took advantage of this and see can we actually eliminate some of the non-essential regions of this phage genome, where you can now put your foreign DNA into this genome and develop what are called the phage vectors. The two popular phage vectors which routinely used are called as the lambda phage vectors and M13 phage vectors. Now, let us see what these are. Lambda. Now, lambda is a linear double stranded bacteriophage, <coughs> which is one of the most well studied bacteriophages. And in fact, a very important information on regulation of gene expression in respect to prokaryotes came from the understanding of the bacteriophage life cycle, especially the lambda life cycle. So, lambda is a large temperate E. coli bacteriophage with a linear large double stranded DNA genome. At each end of the uh, genome, the 5 prime strand overhangs and the 3 prime strands by 12 bases and these single strand overhangs are complementary and annealed to form a cast site following into a host and once annealed, the genome is circular and completely double stranded molecule which serves as a template for a rolling circle of replication. So, the two ends of the genome contain what are the cast sites and once they enter into the uh, E. coli cell, these cast annealed sites annealed with each other and generate a circular DNA, uh, so that <coughs> this phage genome can be replicated by using a rolling circle model. Some of the phages which have been extensively used for making this kind of a phage vector is called, called caron phages. They actually contain replaceable regions that are exchanged for the cold clone target DNA and simultaneously remove reporter genes such as LAC or bio allowing screening of putative candidate clones. <coughs> So, another mechanism to detect cloning event makes use of the fact that lambda requires a certain size of the genome in order to package DNA into the phage head. Removal of the replaceable region leaves the genome too small to package, that is, it must be replaced with DNA to produce viable phage and various size replaceable regions allows a range of insert DNA. What this actually means is that in order for the phage DNA to be packaged inside the phage head, you require a certain size. So, if you if you have a phage without a foreign DNA, then the phage genome is too small and therefore, such phage genomes will not be packaged into the bacterial phage. So, this is one good very good way of screening. So, if you want to eliminate bacterial cells which have taken only the small phage DNA, such part for the phage DNA which have not taken up the inserts will never get packaged into the bacterial head. So, you can easily eliminate those phage DNA molecules which are not recombinant. So, only the recombinant phage DNA in which the foreign DNA has been inserted into the phage is of appropriate size and only they will be packaged into the phage head and therefore, you will get colonies. Many lambda based vectors have been developed by companies such as New England Biolabs, Clonetech, Stratagene, etcetera and they are all commercially available now. So, if you want to clone any large insert which is more than 10 kb or you want to make genomic libraries, the preferred vector is lambda vector and not the plasmid vector. But if you want to make a small gene like 3 or 4 kb and <coughs> you want to just express them in bacteria, plasmid vectors are the appropriate choice. This just mentions one of the popular lambda vectors called as lambda GT10, which is extensively used for uh, making genomic libraries in the late 1980s and late 1990s. 
and for example, it contains the this, these are the uh, phage genomes and contains a head and tail region. The phage genome also contains what is called a non essential region and it contains a, the regulatory genes and basically you create an eco hormone site here which will, which inactivates a gene called C1. So, C1 protein will be made if you clone your gene of your interest into eco hormone site. So, basically what you do is you cut this phage DNA with eco hormone and then put your gene of your interest clone your foreign DNA into the C1 region and this recombinant DNA now can be put inside he is done what is called as so once you have this foreign uh, once you have put your foreign DNA between the head and tail region and regulatory regions you take this recombinant DNA and then <coughs> use what is called as a packaging extract that is these are the proteins and other things which are required for packaging the foreign DNA into the lambda DNA into the bacterial phage and once you have this packaging extract containing all these assembly proteins and ATP and so on and so forth, this DNA will get packaged inside the phage head and now if you now add to the E. coli cells, this phage will be taken up by the E. coli and you will get the bacterial phage will successfully replicate inside the uh, E. coli and you get a recombinant phage. So, you can generate a recombinant phage containing your foreign DNA by using this kind of a mechanism. So, instead of cloning your DNA into a plasmid DNA, you can clone your foreign DNA into a phage DNA and then package this into a recombinant phage and then infect E. coli cells with, the, with this phage. So, you get large amounts of these recombinant phages. What are the advantages of this lambda vectors? It can accept insert up to 25 kilo bases, whereas the plasmid vectors would be discussed just now can accept only up to 10 kilo base DNA <coughs> and the efficiency of infection is very high compared to low efficiency of transformation of the plasmid DNA into E. coli and they produce very tiny blocks. So, you can screen much larger number of colonies. Whereas, if you make a library cDNA library or a genomic library in a plasmid vector, you can only screen about 5000 colonies per plate. Whereas, if you make a same library in a phage vector, you can screen up to 50000 blocks in a single plate. So, it is a huge advantage. I have given some references which you can use for uh, studying more about these lambda vectors and so on and so forth. Another very popular bacteriophage vector which is routinely used for generating recombinant DNA molecules is called as M13. The difference between M13 phage and the lambda phage is lambda phage is a double stranded DNA, M13 is a single stranded DNA. And another important feature is see, M13 is that it can exist both in a single stranded form as well as a double stranded form. Inside the bacterial cells it exists as a double stranded form and once it comes out as a phage, in the phage it exists as a single stranded form. So, I I will not go into the details because these are all mostly prokaryotic vectors. You can actually go through some of these details and understand how an M13 phage is constructed. One can always go to the website of New England Biolabs. Extensive details about some of these vectors are given in these websites. So, I strongly urge you to visit some of these websites, NAB. All the details about these vectors, bacteriophage vectors, plasmid vectors are given in this website. The other important vector that are designed were called as cosmid vectors. Now, cosmid vectors are plasmid that contain coercive ends of bacteriophage lambda and they allow packaging of DNA into the lambda phage heads. So, the, what are the advantage of casmids? Package large inserts and thus are ideal for genomic libraries. They have also a selectable marker, have an origin of replication. They also have a polylinker with multiple cloning sites. They have the same cost sequences like the lambda, so that they can be easily packaged into virus heads and <coughs> they are packaged in defective virus phage particles. They produce the difference between a cosmid and a phage is that cosmid produce colonies whereas phages produce blocks. This is the major distinction between a cosmid vector and a phage mid vector or a phage vector. Again cosmid vectors are actually made from a number of companies. Here is one of the cosmid vectors made by a company called Stratagene called PWE5. Again it is a plasmid with a lambda phage cos sites so that they can circularize inside bacterial cells. It can take up to 40 kilo base of inserts whereas the phage can take up only about 25 kilo bases. So, cosmids can take up even longer DNA. So, the foreign DNA can be easily cloned into these multiple cloning sites of this phage made uh, cosmids, packaged and infect E. coli and in, in E. coli it propagates like a plasmid. <coughs> and it also has what is called as a neomycin marker. So, this plasmid can also be introduced to eukaryotic cells and you can also select eukaryotic cells harboring these cosmid molecules. Again you have packaging extracts. So, once you have generated recombinant DNA containing the foreign DNA inserted to the uh, cosmid vector, you can package them and you can produce a recombinant phage. But the advantage of, of this is that once it is inside the E. coli cell, this will multiply like a plasmid. That is the dif differentiation between a cosmid vector and a phage vector. 
Similarly, you have phosmids, which are again hybrid combinations of phages and plasmids, very similar to cosmids. We will not go into the details. Some of the very important uh, or very successful plasmids are, <coughs> uh, for example, the PUC 118 and 119, which also contains what is called an M13 packaging origin site, and therefore, it allows the plasmids to be packaged as single strand DNA into M13 page phage heads. So, the blue script M13 again is a very popular vector made by Stratagene. Again, we have PTZ vectors made by GE Healthcare, earlier used to be called as Formatia. These are all very, very important to call phage mates or phosmates, which has been tremendously extensively used in the area of molecular biology and recombinant DNA production. If you want to clone even larger fragments of DNA, you have no called as what well is called bacterial artificial chromosomes or BACs. Now, BACs can hold up to 300 kilobases of DNA. You can see we started with the plasmids, which can hold up to 10 kb. We went then to phage vectors, which can hold up to 25 kb. We went to cosmids, where you can clone up to 50 kb. Now, we have bacterial artificial chromosomes, which can take up to 300 kilobases of foreign DNA. So, you can see depending upon what size of DNA you want to clone, you can choose any one of these vectors. So, the F factor of E. coli is capable of handling large segment of DNA. The recombinant bacterial artificial chromosomes are introduced in the E. coli by electroporation. And once inside the cell, the recombinant bacterium replicates like an F factor. And one of the very popular bacterial artificial chromosomes used is called as PBAC108L. <coughs> we will not again go into the details, but these are all very, very popular vectors, in fact, used for introducing large chunks of DNA into bacteria. <coughs> These BACs and the ACs, they all played a very, very important role in things like human genome sequencing and all that. When you have to clone huge amounts of huge pieces of human DNA, into these human genome projects, mouse genome projects and, and, and such things, these BACs and the ACs have made a very, very important difference. So, just like we had a bacterial artificial chromosomes, we have yeast artificial chromosomes. They can also hold up to 500 kilobases of DNA <coughs> and the ACs are designed to replicate as plasmids in bacteria when for no foreign DNA is present. And once a fragment is insert, the ACs are transferred into cells and they replicate like eukaryotic chromosomes. So, the ACs contain a yeast centromere, two yeast centromere telomeres, a bacterial origin of replication and bacterial selection mark, mark, marker and yeast plasmate behaves like an yeast chromosome. The other important aspect that we can now discuss is called as the expression vectors. They can also be constructed from any plasmid or virus vectors. <coughs> The purpose of these expression vectors is to overexpress a protein from a cloned gene. So far, many of the vectors we have discussed, they are called cloning vectors. You cannot really express your protein in large amounts using these cloning vectors, but now you have expression vectors where you put a powerful promoter and you can express your gene as well. So, these are called as expression vector. So, the difference between a cloning vector and expression vector is that cloning vector can just clone the genes, whereas in the expression vectors usually contain very powerful promoters. So, you can not only clone a gene, you can also express the protein encoded by the gene in very high amounts. So, usually expression vectors contain a very strong promoter upstream of the cloned gene as well as strong terminated promoter, phage gene promoter such as lambda, left forward promoter or a T7 promoter are very popularly used in vectors like PET vectors and PT7 vectors, which are very, very popular expression vectors that people now use for making common proteins. I will just take a couple of minutes to explain what are called as a PT7 vectors, T7 promoter based expression vectors, which are extensively used today in the area of molecular biology and recombinant DNA technology. What is the mechanism of T7 expression system? T7 RNA polymerase is a RNA polymerase code by, coded by the T7 bacteriophage and this T7 RNA polymerase recognizes a very short sequence about 15 to 20 bases. That is called as a T7 promoter. So, what you do is that <coughs> you place this T7 RNA polymerase gene under the promoter under a IPTG inducible lac promoter and put it in a chromosomal DNA of a bacterial cell. And usually the E. coli strain which harbors such a T7 RNA polymerase in the bacterial in its chromosome is usually called BL21 DE3 E. coli cells. Then you introduce your plasmid, which actually contains your gene of interest downstream of a T7 promoter. <coughs> so, your foreign gene of interest downstream of the T7 promoter is placed in a plasmid and then you introduce plasmid into this E. coli cells. Now, if you take these cells and add IPTG, the IPTG will induce the lag promoter the T7 RNA polymerase enzyme will synthesize from the bacterial chromosome. That T7 RNA, T7 RNA polymerase will now come and bind to the T7 RNA promoter, binding, promoter site present in the plasmid and induce the expression of your foreign gene. So, you can see the RNA polymerase comes from the bacterial chromosome and goes and binds to the promoter site present in the plasmid and your protein is expressed in very high amounts. <coughs> so, the T7 RNA polymerase gene is from the T7 phage, it is not present in E. coli. The T7 RNA polymerase gene is integrated into the chromosome of E. coli using a temperate phage DE3. 
So, D E 3 stands for a temperate phage. The T 7 RNA polymerization is under the control of a lag promoter. Therefore, by adding IPTG, you can induce the host to produce T 7 RNA polymerase and this T 7 RNA polymerase activity is much higher than E coli RNA polymerase and therefore, protein expression by T 7 expression factor is very high. So, you can express proteins at very high levels using this T 7 based expression system. I have just discussed some of, described some of the very popular T 7 based expression vectors that are sold by a number of companies. I will not go into the details. One of them called as a PR set A, B, C and so on and so forth. You can go to this, this, this is sold by a company called Clone Tech. You can go to these websites and learn more about them. So, what I discussed so far is something about vectors. I could just mentioned here, we just talked about cloning vectors, we talked about expression vectors. There are also what are called as transcription vectors, where you can make large amounts of RNA using what is called the T 7 RNA polymerase and SP 6 RNA polymerase. You also what are called the PCR cloning vectors called P 2 p and so on and so forth. But since they are not directly related to eukaryotic gene expression, we will not discuss about those things. One can always go and read more about them. <coughs> you have secretion vectors, where you can secrete your protein of your interest. You have cosmid vectors, lambda vectors, phage meets one can go and read up and I have listed here what are the major features of these vectors and what are their applications and what are the characteristic features of these vectors. One can read up this and then get some overall view about what these vectors are. So, what we will dis discuss in the next class, so far we discussed primarily about prokaryotic cloning vectors and prokaryotic expression vectors and with this background of knowledge in the next class, we will discuss about what are eukaryotic expression vectors. So, the eukaryotic expression vectors are similar to prokaryotic expression vectors. They are also constructed in E. coli. They usually are shuttle vectors. So, we first clone the genes, propagate the plasmids in E. coli and then shift them to eukaryotic cells. They contain a, again regulatable promoter, usually they also contain intron and usually CDNAs are used for expressing eukaryotic vectors. Why do you need a eukaryotic expression vector? <coughs> they, 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 they have many features. I think we will discuss these things in the next class in more detail. They contain many features which are not present in prokaryotic expression vectors and if you want many of these features, you have to clone your gene into eukaryotic expression vectors. I just mentioned some of the very classical papers which I think one can go through and understand how the biotechnology industry um, was started in the 1970s and 1980s and uh, how a lot of people made money using these kinds of a uh, technologies. I think I will stop here. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.